First of all, Jacques Lachey for having us. May Allah SWT reward all the Shabab, the youngsters that put this together uh, and make this a source of, of reward for you on your Mizan of Hasanat. And allow this to be a source of benefit for all of us. Uh, not just a temporary benefit, but inshallah, a everlasting benefit in this world and the hereafter, inshallah ta'ala. The topic that I was given was to have a discussion about what happens after death. And generally the first thing people think about when they talk about after death is think about Jannah and Jahannam. But inshallah today we'll speak about a realm that is not spoken about as much, but it is a subject and a topic which is prevalent within the books of our, of our scholars where there is a um, stage in between the life of this world and the life of Jannah. There's a stage in between, inshallah, we'll try to discuss that stage in the limited time that we have. Obviously that stage is fairly close to home for me, so inshallah we'll try our best to make sure it um, stays on topic. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah rabbil alameen wal-aqwata lil-muttaqeen wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya wa al-mursaleen Sayyidina Muhammad al-Nabi al-Alameen al-Ladhi ismuhu maktuban fi al-Injili wa al-Tawrat amma ba'd Faqad qala Allah ta'ala fi kitabihi al-Aziz Ba'da a'udhu billahi min shaytan al-Rajim Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Wa man lam yaja'al allahu lahu nur fama lahu min nur وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يا أبا سفيان جئتكم بكرامة الدنيا والآخرة أسلم تسلم. Your brothers, youngsters, and sisters in Islam. One of the things that we often find ourselves saying is, how is it possible for us to prepare for a time in an area, a place that we can never see, but rather it's just something which has been spoken about. How can we prepare for an akhirah, a paradise, a, a box that we will lay in that we have never seen, but just heard about? And we allow ourselves to be deceived by the simple fact that we can't see it. And because we can't see it, it must not be as real as they say. But for some reason, the oxymoron, the dichotomy is in everything else in life, Despite the fact that we can't see it, we still do it. Us not being able to see it doesn't stop us from making effort for it. A simple example is when we are choosing our career as kids, as high school kids, students, not kids, as high school students and getting into your freshman year in college, we're choosing our careers and we'll find ourselves saying that I'm choosing this career because it'll be better for me and my family. I'll be better for my children. I'll be better when I get married. I'll be better as a career. I'll be better when, I get, when, I, when I'm 50 years old. This has a better retirement plan. You ha you don't even, we don't even know if we're going to get married. We don't even know if we're going to have children. We don't even know if we're going to be able to retire. Allah might take us before we retire. All of those, all of those variables that play such a significant role in us making that decision are not real. They're just spoken about. But because they're spoken about so much, it finds a way to become a reality in our life. Similarly to the youngsters, the more we speak about the Akhirah, the more real it will become for us. The more we speak about it, the more we talk about it, it doesn't make us just more fearful of it, but it makes us more conscious of it, that it's something which is real. And I'll say that, let it not be that the reality has to strike so close to home that it's dangerous. And then you realize how real that reality was. You know, they say that, they often say that it could have been worse. It could have been? Have you not heard that before, that statement? It could have been? Worse. Rarely in your life will you find yourself saying that it couldn't have been worse. It could not have been worse. And it's in those moments you realize that dunya is just a fraction of the life that Allah wants us to live. And I don't mean that by a fraction meaning, oh, don't work for dunya. I mean everything in dunya. And all of that which it, which it contains is a fraction of the reality of who Allah wants us to be in the long run. You know, when a, kid is in, when a student is in high school and the parents are motivating them to do certain things, that's just a fraction 
of what they want to see. They want to see that child become that engineer, that physician, and live a prosperous life. Similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes us go through the things that we do so that we can realize that this is just a fraction of what really matters. What really matters. And as heavy as that may sound, it's real. I, find, I sometimes find it interesting that we're talking about college to a kid that's hardly finished grade 7. Isn't that too early, they say? No, it's not. Let them plan their career. Let them plan their career. They're still six years away. Let them plan their career. Closer than any college or university that we will go to is the time or the moments that perhaps we will leave the world. And when we leave the world, all that will help us is the light that we allow, that light that we ignite while living in this world. So when we pass away, which we all one day will do, one of you will, bury, will be burying me and, or I will be burying you. This is the reality that every one of us have to face. I go visit my brother almost on a daily basis when I stand on his grave and I kneel over to touch his, the dirt that is covering him. I say to myself that, just give me a few years and I'll be able to hug you again. Just give me a few years or give me a few moments and I'll be there with you. And those are now moments that you look forward to. Imagine if we realize that we love the Prophet and we love more than we love our siblings. Imagine if we were able to come to that realization that we actually love the Prophet more than we love anybody else. And it's just a matter of some time before we will hug the Prophet. And we will be within his gatherings. So when we leave the world, we don't go straight to Jannah. Inshallah, all of us will be going to Jannah. But that's not the first step. The Prophet Sallallahu explains that there's a journey that every one of us will go through. And that is the journey of what we call Barzakh. Barzakh means the journey of the interval be between this life and Jannah. There are three lives that we live. Three lives. And one, 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 thing, one thing that makes human beings special and makes us unique is that once we are born, we never die. And I'm not talking about this in a philosophical manner, I'm talking about this in a very basic surface level manner, that once we are born, once we are created, Allah doesn't take our life away. Allah just changes the way our life is being lived. So first we live in the realm of the womb of our mother. That's how it starts. And then we come into this world, and we call this the life of Hayat dunya the life of this world that we feel like it's, it's all we have. But when Hayat dunya finishes, which it will finish for all of us, starts the life of the Barzakh. And the life of the Barzakh apparently takes place in the grave, but there's something beyond that that we cannot see. The dirt that we lay our loved ones in is perhaps the most comfortable bed they've ever had in their life. Perhaps the most comfortable room that they've ever had in their life. The kafan that they're wrapped in is the most comfortable clothing that one could ever aspire to wear. Because the moment they're placed in that grave, in that box that we look at and we're so fearful of, and the Prophet one day was talking to the Sahabas and he says, Continue remembering that which allows the desires to be driven away. And it pushes all desires away. And the Sahaba say, what is that thing which allows us to control our nafs and control our desires? Because if we are not controlling our desires, your brothers and sisters, then there's only one or two ways around it. Either we are controlling our nafs or our nafs is controlling us. There's no third option. And the Prophet told the Sahabas, that which allows you to control your day-to-day -day desires is dhikr al-mawt, just remembering death. Just remember it as much as you can. And it's not supposed to take us in a whirlpool of depression or a, 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 a valley of just anxiety, but rather it's supposed to make us feel comfortable because whatever we're going through is not going to last. And we have to work for something which is much bigger and much more fulfilling. Much more fulfilling. So this box that we are placed in is an extension 
of how we live our life. There are two places that the body, or two things that the body can experience when it's placed within the grave. You put the loved one down and you throw dirt on their face. Any of us, if someone dares to attempt to throw dirt on our face, it could be the closest person to us in our life and we will lose our mind. You're throwing dirt on me? Dirt. Allah makes us throw dirt on our loved ones, reminding us that this is what we really are. مِنْهَا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ وَفِيهَا نُعِيدُكُمْ وَمِنْهَا نُخْرِجُكُمْ تَارَةً أُخْرَى That you are brought out from this and you will be returned to this and you will be retrieved from this. This is where it starts and this is where it will continue. So once you place that person in the grave, the new realm begins. The moment the person is placed in the grave and the grave is covered, the ruh that was physically separated from the body, and let me just try to explain this as much as I can, the soul is like a satellite. It doesn't have to be in the body to be affecting the body. It doesn't have to be physically in the body to be affecting the body. The satellites are all the way in space, but it gives everything life. If a satellite goes down, the lights go down, internet goes down, internet goes down, it's a big problem, you know. So we're pretty much living off what? The satellite. The satellite is the material soul of the world that we live in. Everyone's afraid, every country is afraid about their satellite because it's their soul. It doesn't have to physically be there, but it's connected. Similarly, the soul may change its position but never loses its connection. So when we're living in this world, the soul is inside of our body. Allah puts the soul inside of our body. And when we, temper for, for a temporary moment, the soul is physically removed from the body and is taken up. And the body is then placed inside of the grave. And as the person is leaving the world, if we live a life that is worth living, a life of righteousness, a life that pleases our Allah, and a life that is within the prism that our Prophet has taught us in, a wide prism may I say, goalposts that are wider than many of us think, if we live that life, when we leave the world, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to us, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا رَبُّنَ اللَّهِ ثُمَّ اسْتَقَامُوا تَتَنَزَّلُوا عَلَيْهِ that individual who says Allah is my Lord every one of us believe in Allah that is the greatest blessing that any of us have I have after my brother's tragedy met individuals that are Muslims and when I seek when I find that you know I'm finding some form of counsel from them I sometimes find myself giving them counsel because those individuals are such that have lost loved ones parents siblings that were not Muslim how do you console someone whose loved one left this world without Islam? Amul Huzn was called Amul Huzn, the year of grief, because the Prophet ﷺ lost his uncle who left without Islam. Ibrahim السلام, his whole life dreamt of the day that his father could become Muslim. And Allah reminded him he did not become Muslim, so you can't ask forgiveness for him. We believe in Allah. Angels descend. You know when we are traveling for a long time, maybe going to college, maybe going for um, you know, a trip with our friends for a year or for going on a retreat for even two weeks. When you go to the airport, sometimes, especially from the Daisy family, you have like the whole khandan come drop you off. Right? And you also have a whole khandan come what? Pick you up. You feel like the most special person in the world and you realize, not that special. You know, just, <laughs> this is what everyone gets, not just me. So when you, re when you reach Pakistan, India, wherever you're from, after not going for 10 years, 15 years, what happens? Everyone comes to the airport, all hugging you, kissing you, like, yo, who are you? I'm that khala, I'm that puppo, I'm that uncle, I'm like, brother, I just dabs, COVID, brother. You know, don't hug me that much. Imagine, imagine the angels that have been assigned to us, that have been watching over us 
for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years. Finally are told that you're coming home. They're told that you are coming home. How excited would those angels be to receive you? How excited would those angels be to take care of you? To make sure that your journey is a journey of comfort and not a journey of distress. Allah brings these angels down to us that welcome us into our new home. And not only do they welcome us, they say something to us. They say, hey, لا تخافوا ولا تحزنوا. Don't be afraid. I was with you your entire life. And some scholars say, these are the angels that write all of our good deeds. The angels of our right shoulder. They will say, we will be able to see them say, hey, don't be at ease. I'm with you. وَأَبْشِرُوا بِالْجَنَّةِ and be happy that Jannah is waiting for you. And then they will say, نَحْنُ أَوْلِيَاءُكُمْ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ We were your best friends. Awliya comes from the word wali, which means a very close friend. We were your close friends while you were living in this world. You were never able to see us, but we were always there for you. And now we will continue to use this relationship to protect you in the Akhirah. And you will have whatever you want in the Akhirah. Nuzulam min ghafoorir rahim. Allah says, there will be nothing but a continuous showering of blessings and forgiveness for this person. When this person is placed in the grave, that soul of theirs that was taken up in a, you could call it a gift box. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains in Surah Waqi'ah that when their soul is taken out, فَلَوْلَا إِذَا بَلَغَتِ الْحُلْقُومِ In the tafsir of this ayah, the soul is removed in this gift box and it's wrapped up in a kafan and it's taken up, it's protected, it's, it's a jewelry box for the angels. They're so happy that this soul is coming back home. They take this soul, where do they take it? They take it to this place Known as Illiyin. Inna al-abrar lafi Illiyin. This elite area that only people who have a pass can enter. You know, sometimes you enter into the airport and there's a long line. You're like, man, I wish I had Delta Lounge. Sometimes you walk into a flight and you're traveling to Pakistan, India, Saudi Arabia for Umrah, and you're going into economy class. Right, and you see everyone else, some people that you know, are walking with their heads higher than the airplane's roof, right, going to first class. They're like, man, I want to go there too. I just want to walk like that, right? That's, that's, you need a pass to get there. That's first class. And you look at it like, man, I want to go there. This area which is called the Illiyin, the elite area, where only some individuals can get into. Their soul is taken into Illiyin, and it enters into Illiyin, and guess who's there to welcome us? This is one of the most beautiful things, and this is one of those things that brought me so much comfort after my brother Rahimullah is leaving this world and entering into the next realm. That the moment that enter into the gates of Illiyun, in the Sidratil Muntaha, in the Jannatul Ma'wa. Allah explained in Surah Najm, there's this place called Jannatul Ma'wa. Jannatul Ma'wa, some Mufassirun state, is the place, is the quarter where the souls of the pious people recollect. And they reconvene. So as we are reconvening in this gathering, there are people that are reconvening in the gathering of Illiyun, which is placed next to Jannah, which you can call the waiting lounge of Jannah. They're waiting in the waiting lounge of Jannah. The waiting lounge of Jannah is such that muttaki'ina ala surrin masfufa. There are beautiful sofas that are aligned and the people that enter this waiting lounge are given a drink that they're allowed to drink that brings ease and comfort to them. And as they enter and the doors of this waiting lounge is open up, the people that greet them are the sahabas and their family members that have passed away before them. So we may be meeting our family members in this world, but when our loved one leaves, he or she is meeting our grandparents. He or she is meeting our uncle or auntie or whoever has passed away. And they get together and it's explained under the tafsir of these ayat that when they meet, they hug each other. And then they ask each other, hey man, it's been so long since we've met you. We were waiting for you to come. We were waiting for you. Hey man, how is that person doing? I'm sure some of my family members asked Abdul Rahim, Rahimullah, Sheikh Abdul Rahim, that how's Abdul Wahab doing? How's your mom doing? How's your dad doing? 
And I only hope that he was able to tell them the good things that we are trying to do. And then he meets the Prophet. And he meets the Sahabas. This is the gathering that we aspire to be a part of. We don't aspire to be a part of a panel which has the greatest self-made billionaires of this country. We don't aspire to be a part of this a panel in which the smartest and the most intellectual minds are a part of. Oh wow, we're a part of a panel of politicians or a part of a panel of celebrities or a part of a panel of athletes. No, no, we are a part of a panel of Sahabas. Illiyun. We will allow, we are, we are allowed to enter into a gathering that nobody else is able to enter into. And then we sit there and we talk to them. And when the person is put back in the grave, this soul comes back into their body. And it enters their body. And the soul and the body are now reconnected physically. And the questions come forth. And hopefully all of us are able to answer the question. When the soul reconnects with the body in the grave, the soul and the body will be able to together answer the questions that are put towards them. And then the soul will be once again, in some narrations, the body and the soul will go to the Illiyun. And they'll be able to enjoy the gatherings of people in the Akhirah. So as we are living in this world and seeing each other and benefiting from each other and enjoying each other's company, there'll be people in Illiyun that are also enjoying each other's company. And that grave of theirs becomes a light for them, a light that illuminates beyond their walls that are covering them, small hole or a small box that we put them in is not what they see, but rather they're able to see with the soul that they have, the eyes of the soul, they're able to see something much more, much more beautiful. And that is their friends, their companions, their prophets, sahabas. And the beauty of all of this, as I was explaining, is the soul is like a satellite. So when we go visit our loved ones, and there is no denying this fact, I don't care what anyone says, that when the, soul, when the person is placed in the grave, and you and I go visit people, and visit our loved ones, the Prophet ﷺ reminds us that when we go visit them and we say salam to them, radda alayya salam, they respond to our salam. And the Prophet ﷺ says, Man marra ala qabrin fa sallama alayhi wa huwa ya'rifuhu, radda alayhi salam wa yista'nisu bihi. That a person that goes to a grave and that person knew them from before and they say salam to them, that person responds to our salam, not only does he or she respond to our salam, but they actually feel good by us coming there. They feel good, yastanis, they feel comfort, they feel love, they feel a sense of relaxation. And not that they need us to come, because they already have the company of people in the Illiyun, the people of the higher realm. And that higher realm is where we all want to go. And the only way we're going to go there is if Allah continues to bless us with light in this world. You know, there's light, there's nur, which we talk about. It's not an abstract object, but rather it's something that is very tangible. And the more that we work on igniting this nur, the more light we will have when there is no other light in the grave. The nur of our heart will, will, be, will propel light in our grave. Will propel light in the akhirah. And if we keep giving ourselves light in this world, you know they say, keep saving for a rainy day, right? Keep creating, right? keep creating this light for the rainy day, that the day we are placed in our grave, there is a light in the grave. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains that Allahu nurus samawati wal ard, the only person that can give us light is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And those that don't have that light, Allah explains, وَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا أَعْمَالُهُمْ كَسَرَابٍ بَقِيعَةٍ يَحْسَبُهُ الظَّمْآنُ مَاءً He creates a parable in the Qur'an where he talks about those that don't believe. They feel like they're working so hard. And I will end at this example. أَعْمَالُهُمْ They work so hard. They put so much effort into this world. They put so much energy to get something that they are striving for. And they believe, Allah says they believe, they believe if they are just able to get this one more thing, one more car, one more degree, few more dollars, few more zeros, one more child, one more vacation, they believe if they get that, that will give them satisfaction. And they're so thirsty for it, that they're ready to do whatever they want, whatever they can for it. And Allah says when they finally get it, that what they were reaching for, one more haram look, 
One more haram voice. One more haram word. One more means of haram income. One more. That's all I need. If I get it, I'll stop doing it. Allah says when they finally get that which they were working so hard for, it's like that thirsty person that thinks that there is water at the end of the road. And they run towards it. They're so thirsty. But when they finally get there, they realize it's a dry well. It was just a dew that looked like water. It was a mist. There was no water. They think that they got it. No, it's not. Oh, it's, it wasn't really water. Lam yajidhu shay'a. They don't find anything there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains, قُلْ هَلْ أُنَبِّئُكُمْ بِالْأَخْصَرِينَ أَعْمَالَ Should I not tell you about those people who are the biggest losers? The biggest losers. Right? He says, الَّذِينَ ضَلَّ سَعَيُهُمْ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَهُمْ يَحْسَبُونَ أَنَّهُمْ يُحْسِنُونَ سُنْعَا The biggest losers are those individuals whose efforts have been deviated from the right objective. But they are still making a lot of effort. They're working so hard. وَهُمْ يَحْسَبُونَ And the worst part of it is they think that they're doing something very good. And that's the case for those that don't have Iman. And those people that don't have Iman, their souls go to a place called Sijin. Sijin is this, this pit or this cage where the souls that, of people that will go to Jahannam are locked up. And they start seeing and feeling the punishment of the fire while they're still in their grave. This life is called the life of Barsakh. You want to know how long this life is going to be? You want, how long do you think this life is going to be? What do you think? Not anyone? Like this life is approximately what? This life is 60, 70 years? 70 years, 80 years, right? Maximum someone lives 80, 90 years. Maybe 100 years? <laughs> what do you, what, anyone have any... Educated opinions? There's no wrong answer. Except that there is. <laughs> so, the Prophet explains that the life of the grave, the, the duration of it, is like the time between Dhuhr and Asr. That's it. The barzakh is like the time between Dhuhr and Asr. Whilst we are struggling to wake up every day, pray our salats on time, go to work, go to school, Live the struggle that we're living. People that are living in the life of the Barsakh, their journey, one narration mentions that they just finished meeting their loved ones and the horn for the Day of Judgment sounds off. They just finished meeting their loved ones. Hey, you're here. Yeah, man, how you doing, man? I didn't see you for so long. Boom. The Day of Judgment goes off. So the real people that are that are missing out are not those people. They're just, they're in their, what we call the waiting lounge. They, they've already, if you've made it to the waiting lounge, you most probably have a, have a room in the hotel, unless you're a daisy, right? Just there to get some good AC and use the washroom and leave. <laughs> right? You normally are there to stay in a room. If Allah takes us all the way to the waiting lounge of Jannah, Allah will make sure that we get the access towards Jannah as well. And once we get to Jannah, what, what is, and I'm going to end with this actually, what, what is, everyone, just say one thing, anyone, what is the thing that you look forward to most in Jannah? Sisters? Uh, huh? Happiness, mashallah, how old are you? That's awesome, that's a good answer. Any sisters? Go ahead. Oh, mashallah. Somebody is dropping those, those gems. Uh, how about you guys, anything? Study Miftah, what do you have going on? Kuchhe dikhane ke liye. Yeah, me better than me. Yeah? The topic, um, generally the topic of the life after death is, can be a very lengthy topic with a lot of uh, meticulous details that you know, we don't have the time for right now. But I think the general overview for us to realize is that there is a life that is between the life of um, the Akhirah and the life that we are living now in our physical bodies. And that is the life of the Barzakh, which is the life that has two folds. One spectrum of that life is lived within the heavens, which is called Sidratul, which is called Jannatul Ma'wa in a realm called the Iliyun. Try to remember those terminologies. And the other part of that spectrum is our physical bodies that are still in the earth. The bodies are still on the earth, but the satellite is still working. The satellite is still working. So when we go visit someone, it doesn't have to be that the soul comes back physically in the body, but the satellite is working. So when you visit them and you say salam to them, they hear it and they feel it and they reply. 
Albeit that the soul still remains in this area called Iliyun. And they're enjoying from the blessings of Iliyun, which some of them I spoke about. Now after that, when the few moments of their middle life, their waiting lounge life. You know, no one goes to the waiting lounge to stay there. You get on the airplane, you reach wherever you want to reach, you get to the waiting lounge, you're only there for a few moments and then you go into your hotel or you get seated in a restaurant. So we're here for a few moments. We're with the Prophet, we're with Sahabas, and with all those people that have already reached that area. And we're told at that moment that you have made it. You have made it to this area, and if you made it this far, Allah will take us the rest of the way. When we also pass away, and we are placed in our grave, the same thing happens to us. Our soul is taken out, it's taken in this gift box, it goes all the way up, it enters into this beautiful waiting lounge that has all of the Prophets, the Sahabas, the great messengers, and our friends and family members that we you know, aspire to finally see after so many years. I tell people all the time that they want to be buried next to their loved ones. I say physical closeness doesn't mean that you're really close. It doesn't matter where you're buried. It doesn't matter where you are buried in regards to the distance from your loved one. Yes, it feels better if you're close physically, but the reality is that in the Akhirah, in this realm of the Barzakh, they're physically together within the Iliyun. Then, a moment comes where the trumpet is blown and we get together. And when we get together, the beauty of the Day of Judgment for believers is we will be gathered once again within groups. The groups will be sorted not based upon ethnicity, culture, degree, background, but rather the groupings will be made upon what quality we, as we, we aspire to live by the most. So if we were individuals that lived within the qualities of, of generosity, kindness, forgive, forgiving, and the qualities of worship, then we will be raised with those people. And if we lived within the qualities of lying, backbiting, jealousy, animosity, and leaving prayer, then those will be the people that we are raised with. We will be raised within the groups that we chose to be with in this world. So choose wisely while you live here because they will be the same people that you will be raised with in the Akhirah. So once we are raised together, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then continues to tell us that after Hisab is done, the Day of Judgment has pretty much four stages. And I will just say them, but I can't explain them right now. The four stages, the first one is what we call the, the Maidan of Hashar, the Mahshar where every single human being will be gathered. And this gathering will take place, some say Arafah, some say in Baytul Maqdis, right? One of, those, one of these two places, on the earth. And the angels will be brought down, Jannah and Jahannam will be shown to us, but it will be just, uh, there is no hisab happening here. It's just a plain field, that's all it is. After some time, we will ask, the Prophet will ask Allah to start hisab. Before Hisab begins, we will have to pass the second stage is passing the bridge of Sirat. This is the second stage. While we are passing the bridge of Sirat, many people will not even be able to make it across. And they will fall into Jahannam. They won't even have a reckoning. Their punishment was the Hashar. Standing there and waiting for 70 years with the sun closer to them than their own, than their own shadow. Right? This is Hashar. All of this that we hear about is Hashar. Then they have to cross this bridge. Some will fall in the bridge, not the people that don't have Iman will fall inside of this, inside of this, you know, this pit that is waiting for them. Believers will make it through. And once we make it through, we will reach a place which is called the Midan of Hisab, where the reckoning will be done. And the reckoning will be done where the scales are. This is after the Sirat. So the first is Hashar, then is Sirat, then is the reckoning. The reckoning. If you make it across the bridge, most probably you are a believer. Right? And you will, mo you will hopefully get through. But then there will be some people whose good deeds will be less than their, will be less than their evil deeds. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to these people as munafiqun. They will be sent back. They will be sent back. And they will say, because they also crossed the bridge, they will say, Alam nakum ma'akum. We, we thought we were together. Allah will say, no, you're not together. Physically you are together, but internally you don't have iman. Right? And what lives inside will sooner or later express itself in the external realm of our life. If it's not in this life, it will be in the hereafter. If it's not now, it will be later. 
So now when we get to this place of Hisab, we get our Book of Deeds in our right hand insha'Allah. And then the fourth part of this journey is when we will take water from the Prophet wasallam from the Hawd of Kawthar. And now after taking this water, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says something so beautiful where He says, وَسِيقَ الَّذِينَ اتَّقَوْ رَبَّهُمْ إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ زُمَرًا That after all of this, families will be gathered together. Families will be gathered together and they will enter into Jannah together. The narration mentions that there will be someone that will be entering into Jannah and as they're entering into Jannah, they look around them and say, Hey, where's my mom? Where's my son? Where's my brother? And my brother's not here. Where's my sister? And Allah says, no, we will bring them all back together. All the believers. You know, there's one thing to succeed alone. And there's one thing to succeed as a family. Success is truly success when everyone does it together. Or else if one person is struggling in your family, it's not really a success story. It's not really a success story. So our responsibility, every one of us, is to become individuals that live not only for themselves, but live for each other. Not, in, not simply in talking about the basic necessities of life, but rather talking about the more luxurious, lavish things of the soul. That we feed each other good things for our soul, so that on the day of judgment, when we are entering Jannah, we can see each other. And that will be real. And that will be enjoyment beyond any measure that can be calculated in this world. We cannot encapsulate the pleasure of being able to enter into Jannah together. Allah says, now the family will be brought into Jannah together. You know, sometimes in this world we sit down and we say, when we get together on Eid, or we get together as a family on, on a specific occasion, and the brothers, the sisters, the parents, the cousins, we're all together like, and now we've, we've succeeded in something. We made it into college, we've graduated, we've made it into grad school, we've got married. Something has happened that we consider to be a success, and it may be a success. And there's nothing wrong with success in this world, rather it's encouraged. Allah says, don't forget about your success in this world, do it. Just try hard, work hard, but not at the compromise of your akhirah. And I ask all of you, whenever you do something in this world and you succeed, ask yourself this question, at what compromise? What compromise am I allowing myself to do? Is it at the compromise of my salat? Is it, the, is it at the compromise of me disrespecting my parents? Is it at the compromise of me doing something which was impermissible? Just because I made it doesn't really mean I made it. If I've made it but left everything else behind, then really, I've clothed myself with a dead heart. It's a clone. It's not real. It's not real. It's not real.